but first off, thanks for being here. I'm excited to be back with all of you. Um, and just by way of reminder, I'm going to put our agenda in the chat today so you, you can refer to what we're going to talk about. Um, I am going to try to do a better job of pacing myself through the agenda this week. Uh, we'll see how I do. And additionally, uh, I also wanted to just remind you of my name and my contact information and some of UEN's resources just very briefly. So again, my name is Braxton Thornley. Uh, my email address is in the chat if you need it, but it's just braxton at uen.org. And then if you ever want to find uh, more information about me or my team or anything like that, you can do that through UEN's website, which is also now in the chat. Um, and importantly, on UEN's website, you have the ability to go to our professional development tab, which I've talked about before. And the main things to note on that professional development tab is first off, our team is right over here. So you can contact any of us if you need. Uh, we have Canvas resources right here under our uh, EDU partners. And then additionally, um, oops. Additionally, over here on the side, we have some technology courses and we have a variety of Canvas courses that you can enroll in for free. So I just wanted to give you a quick reminder of all those elements. Uh, again, remind you who I was, uh, but that's the very short version of our introduction today because I'm hoping to just get right into the content uh, so that we can make sure to get to everything that we need to. So I am actually going to switch over to our agenda and I'm going to just briefly cover what we're going to talk about today, and then we'll start stepping through it together. Now, the focus of today's session is to talk about how to facilitate assessment and feedback in Canvas. Uh, but I do want to touch on a little bit of what we talked about last time as well. So as you can see, we've already gone through like the welcome back and UEN resources. Um, but I want to start by just summarizing what we talked about with modules last time. Uh, that's going to be a really brief conversation. And then I also want to start touching on this idea of universal design for learning. Uh, so we will chat briefly about those elements, mostly just as a refresher. And then after we do that, uh, I'm going to kind of frame our conversation today around this idea of how do we assess uh, learners as accurately as possible, and then how do we provide them feedback in optimal ways as well. That's going to lead us into going into Canvas and starting to build assignments. Now, in some of the previous uh, sessions, you've maybe already explored with creating assignments. Today, we won't talk too much about the rich content editor. We'll review it just briefly. But the main thing that we're going to talk about with assignments is all of the assignment controls that you have and how you might adjust those for your learners. We'll also talk about how to create rubrics in Canvas and attach those rubrics to your assignments. And then following that, we're going to briefly touch on Canvas discussions. Uh, we won't spend a ton of time there. And then we'll also talk about creating quizzes in Canvas and some of the dynamics to be aware of there. Uh, that chunk, talking about assignments and discussions and quizzes, is going to be the bulk of our session today. I'm guessing that that's going to take probably about 40-ish minutes, but then I do want to close out this session by talking about how you can deliver feedback to your learners in Canvas. Uh, and we're going to do that mostly by talking about SpeedGrader. And we're going to talk about some of the features inside of SpeedGrader that might make the feedback process a little bit faster for you and also a little bit more meaningful for your students. So that's our plan for today. That's where we're headed. But before we dive into everything, uh, can I respond to any questions before we get started? All right, perfect. Well, we will go ahead and get going then. Uh, I am going to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to go ahead and get into Canvas. So if you'd like to follow along with me, now is a great time to sign into Canvas. Alex has already put the link to your Canvas instance in the chat so you can access it there. Uh, but go ahead and take a moment to sign in. As you are signing in, I'm going to talk through some of the things that we discussed last time so that you have a minute or two to get signed in. And then after that, we'll dive into building things today. Um, 
So first off, I am going to go to uh, my sandbox course that I've used throughout our sessions. And again, this is just an empty course or relatively empty course uh, that doesn't have students in it where I can just build things and break things and everything's fine. So that's where I am right now. Uh, and you may remember that during our last session, we ended by really quickly talking about modules. And I wanna to return to this idea of modules just so that you can have that in mind as you start creating more content today. Now on this page here, you can see that I've set up my homepage so that modules appear on my homepage itself. Now we've talked about how you can set up a more visual homepage and that's what we typically recommend is that you create a page that has visuals and information about your class and maybe pertinent links, things like that. And for our purposes today, I just have modules set as my homepage so that we can continue looking at these. Now this unit one module is the module that we built together last time. Uh, and so you may remember me kind of stepping through that and adding some of those elements last time we talked. But the important thing that I want to bring up about our modules here is simply the idea that modules are a way to group and organize your content. Now, today, as we start building more and more content, that's going to be really important for us because most of our learners are going to do best when it's easy to find the things that they're in charge of finding. Um, there's been a lot of research done that shows that the more organized your course is, both in person and in online settings, uh, the better students do and the clearer understanding they have of your learning trajectory and your learning outcomes. Now, with that in mind, I just want to touch on some of the things that can go into a module, and then we'll start building some assignments today. So first off, like I mentioned before, here's my module. We have a few elements inside of it, but if I want to add any elements to this module, I just click on that plus button. Once I click on that plus button, you can see that I can click on my drop down menu here and I have all of these options of things that I can add. So I can add assignments, quizzes, files, pages, discussions, text headers, URLs to external sites and external tools. And we will talk about external tools more during our next session. Uh, but today, like I mentioned before, we're going to be focusing on assignments, quizzes, and discussions. Now, all of those elements can go into my module and I can group all of those elements that way. So as you think about your content today and what you're building or what you're working through, Keep in mind how you want to organize it. Do you want to organize it by units? Do you want to organize it by time period? So like week one, week two, week three. Uh, how will that organization work for your course? Just keep that in mind today. Now, all of that said, like I mentioned before today, our goal is to focus on assessment and feedback. Uh, and as you probably already know, there are a variety of ways to assess students. And Canvas is pretty good at facilitating a lot of those different avenues. So as we explore assignments today, I'm going to point out ways to format those assignments to make them work for different types of projects. For instance, sometimes we assess student learning through just a multiple choice quiz and that's great, it's efficient. Um, but other times we want students to do something else. Maybe they're writing something, maybe they're completing some sort of project. And so we want to make sure that what we're creating in Canvas can help facilitate those items. With that in mind, I do want to start today by creating an assignment and beginning to build an assignment with you. Now, there are two ways that you can begin building the assignment in your instance of Canvas. The first way is if you are in modules, and I'm going to go to my modules tab, and if you're in modules, you can create a new assignment by just adding something to your module. So you can always click on this plus button and then make sure that assignment is selected in your drop down menu. And then you can click on create assignment. That's the first route that you can take. The second route that you can take is in your course navigation menu over here. You can also click on assignments. And then at the top, you can click on plus assignment. Now, either way is fine. Today, I'm going to go this route because I want you to be familiar with this assignments page because we're going to be coming back to it in just a moment or two. So for today, I'm going to go to my assignments and then in the upper right hand corner, I'm going to click on plus assignment. Now, once I've done that, you can see that the rich content editor pops up. If you don't remember what the rich content editor is, it's basically just your uh, box that allows you to create context 
content, excuse me, inside of Canvas, wherever you may be. So this, these options look the same in assignments, they look the same in pages, they look the same in announcements and so on and so forth. So all of the controls that we've talked about in previous sessions, you still have for your assignments. Now I'm going to begin by naming my assignment and I'm just going to call it uh, adult ed demo assignment one. What I might recommend for you though, is as you're thinking about your organization, I would keep in mind whether or not you want to use any sort of naming convention. And I mentioned this very briefly last session. All a naming convention is, is if you decide that you're going to organize your content around units, you might say that this is part of unit number one. So I'm gonna put a one in front of it and it's assignment number three inside of that unit. So I'm gonna put 1.3 and a colon, and that can help people find your assignment. Today, if you don't have something like that set up or you're not quite ready to think about all of that quite yet, that's fine too. Uh, I'm just going to call this adult ed demo assignment one. Now, as I could, if I was creating a page, I can add in whatever media or content I want in this uh, assignment. For now, I am just going to type in some sample text just so that you get the idea of how I might format this. So I might say something like instructions, and then down below that, maybe I put in some bullet points um, and I say, oops, say something like step one, do this, this, and this, step two, do this, this, and this, and step three. And obviously if this was a real assignment, I would explain and I could add as much detail as I wanted. I might even uh, bold this. I could even make it bigger if I wanted. Uh, and if I had one available, I might say something like example and put an example below. Again, uh, the main point that I'm trying to emphasize here is that you can include whatever content you need. You can write instructions, you can include a picture, you can embed a Google Doc, whatever works best for you, you still have those options. Today though, we are really interested in the controls that happen below the rich content editor. And this is where you can really control how your assignment is functioning inside of your Canvas course. So as you can see at the top, I get to decide how many points my assignment is worth. Today, I'm going to say that this assignment is going to be worth four points. Right below that though, I have something that says the assignment group. Now, what this refers to is in Canvas, you have the ability to weight different gradebook categories so that some assignments by nature are worth more than others. Uh, a for instance might be helpful here. So when I was teaching in the classroom, my grade book was set up so that 80% of a student's grade was made up of assessments, whatever they were. Uh, these could be projects, writing assignments, but assessments made up 80% of the grade. Practice assignments made up 20%, right? And so if you have any sort of grade weighting scheme like that set up, this is how you would determine those categories. So I might click here and I might say, you know what, I need another group. I need an assessment group. And so I could click on that and just type assessments, add that group. And now Canvas knows to group this assignment under my assessments category. Now I'm going to save the assignment for just a moment because I want to go back. Oops, I need to select one of these. Uh, I want to go back to the assignments page so that I can show you how you can start toying with those groups if you need to. So now that I'm back on this page, you can see that I have one assessment and I have a lot of assignments here. Next to those categories, you'll see that Canvas is telling me that right now assignments make up 0% of a student's grade, assessments make up 0% of a student's grade. But I can click on my three dots here and I can edit those. And now I have a little bit more control in this box. So I can say, you know what, assessments are going to make up 80% of a student's grade. And if I wanted to, I can also set some drop parameters as well. So I can tell Canvas to automatically ignore X number of assignments in a student's grade within this category if I wanted to. So if you have a situation in your class where you say, uh, I'm going to drop your three lowest assignments in uh, the assessments category or whatever the case may be, you can go here to lowest scores and say, I'm going to drop the three lowest scores here. Um, if you're feeling <laughs> really 
I don't know, <laughs> really aggressive. I suppose you could drop the highest scores. I've never seen anyone do that. I don't know why you would need to do that, uh, but you could do that. And then additionally, though, what I think is interesting is you can also tell Canvas, I want to drop the three lowest scores, but I never want to drop X assignment, this assignment. That assignment should always count no matter what. And so you can add that in. Today, I'm not going to worry about all that dropping stuff, but I am going to say that assessments make up 80% of a student's grade. I'll hit save. And then again, if I wanted to set that for another category, I'd click on those three dots, hit edit, and say assignments are going to make up 20% of a student's grade and hit save. And now Canvas is going to automatically do that math for me and my students. Now, that was kind of a sidetrack, but hopefully that explained a little bit of how assignment groups work. But once I go back into my assignment, you'll see that there are a lot more options than just that. So I'm entering back into my assignment. I clicked on edit and I'm going to just come back to these options that I was looking at before. Now, as you can see, I can choose a couple of ways to display students' grades. So I can display it as points. I can display it as percentage, complete, incomplete, so on and so forth. I have all of these options and how I communicate a student's grade to them. Below that is what's going to become really important for you as the instructor. We have this submission type box, and I want to talk through some of the different submission types that are available to you. So first off, we have this drop-down menu right here that I'm going to click on. This drop-down menu gives me five really broad categories for how I can accept assignments in Canvas. The first category is no submission. So if I click this, this is telling Canvas that I am not getting anything from students. I'm just grading them on perhaps something that I see. I typically see this no submission type used the most with teachers who are doing things like reading check-ins, right? And typically this happens in an elementary school where a teacher might walk around with their iPad and they might call students over to their desk or go to the student's desk, have the student read aloud for two or three minutes, and then they're entering a score into Canvas. The student didn't give them anything, nothing was submitted on Canvas, but building it as an assignment creates a space for it in the Canvas gradebook where teachers can then track that information. That's what the no submission option does for you. Similarly, I'm going to skip over online for just a minute and jump to on paper. On paper functions in pretty much the same way, where again, it's not going to allow students to submit anything on Canvas. They aren't going to be able to click a button that says turn in assignment because the assignment is going to say this assignment was completed on paper. And so that's a really good cue for students that, hey, maybe my teacher handed out a worksheet or something like that. I need to turn in that paper assignment to my teacher, but I can't necessarily submit it on Canvas. Again, setting this simply allows you to create a column in your gradebook for that assignment while also not presenting students the opportunity to submit things digitally to you. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. I know that for me, uh, when I was teaching in the classroom, and you've probably worked in similar situations if you aren't right now, uh, I had over 180 students, right? And so if I, turn, if I gave something to students on paper, I did not necessarily want to receive that in all sorts of format without students talking to me first. And this was a good way for me to control that. Um, Below those options, and again, we'll come back to online in just a moment, you'll see external tool and Lucid. We are going to talk about external tools more during our next session, so I'm going to skip over that for now. Lucid, though, just as a quick plug, we're not going to go into the details on Lucid, but if you're not familiar with Lucid, Lucid is a mind mapping or diagramming uh, software that's available online. And during the summer, Lucid signed an agreement with Canvas that said all Canvas users have free unlimited access to Lucid 
if they are accessing Lucid through Canvas. Uh, and so if you want your students to submit something through Lucid, you can set it as a Lucid assignment and that will automatically push them into Lucid and they'll have free unlimited access. Now, we don't necessarily have time to talk about Lucid today, uh, but I will say that it's a really cool tool uh, and it's worth exploring if you're not necessarily familiar with it. The main focus right now, though, is I do want to get back to these online submission types because this is most likely going to be most common for you. So once I click on my online option, you can see that I then get some more options down below. By choosing online, what I am telling Canvas is I want you to have the ability to accept digital assignments from my students. And I'm going to now accept those assignments in whatever formats I choose. So I can give students a text entry box where they just type out a response and we'll look at what that looks like in just a moment. I can ask students to simply submit a website URL. And so again, it's just gonna be a little box, but it's only gonna give them space to submit a link. They won't necessarily be able to just type in there. I can also ask that my students submit media recordings. And this will open up a little box where students can record audio and or video. Uh, and that recording is sent directly to you. Again, that recording just happens right inside of Canvas. So students don't need to go to a separate website or anything like that. They just click on the record button, uh, screen capture or a video capture box pops up. Uh, and they can talk to their camera. If they have a camera, they can just record audio, so on and so forth. Um, below that, you'll see student annotation. And you probably notice that as soon as I click student annotation, it pulled up some files where I can begin searching through files or I can upload a file. The reason why is because what student annotation is, is you are going to give Canvas some sort of file. Let's say that it's maybe a PDF and I am uploading a PDF of a short story. And now what the assignment is going to allow students to do is they're going to have a digital highlighter, digital marker, digital text tool, all of those annotation options that you might expect. And their job is to now mark up the file that I have given them. So an example for me as a former English teacher is I would occasionally give students a student annotation uh, assignment where the text that we were reading together as a class was maybe a short story um, and I had it as a PDF and all they had to do is go in with their highlighter and highlight lines that stood out to them for various reasons that I would define in the assignment description, right? Um, I have seen math teachers use this so that students can uh, annotate their work as they're working through solutions. I have seen shop teachers use this to have students annotate what's wrong with uh, maybe some sort of design or maybe some sort of product that they've created. Uh, so there are a variety of use cases for this, but that's what the student annotation option will do. The final option is perhaps the most straightforward, uh, and this simply asks students to submit some sort of file to you. So they can submit a PowerPoint presentation, they can submit um, a Word document. If they have saved a file, they could submit it this way with file upload. This also works really well if you're asking students to submit images to you for whatever reason. And then as you can see right below that, I have the ability to restrict what type of files are accepted. So I might say something like, I only want to accept PDFs. Uh, and so I would just put dot PDF right in there. Now, that hopefully provides you with a little bit of an overview of the different submission types that you can receive in your Canvas assignments. I want to pause for just a minute here. What questions can I respond to about these submission types before we move on to the rest of the assignment controls that you have? Mm -hmm. Really good point, Jamie. That's a great tip. You could use student annotation assignments to kind of work around Google Drive if people don't have access to that. That's great. 
All right. Well, I am going to assume there aren't any burning questions right now. But again, if you have any questions, feel free to just toss them into the chat. I promise I will get to them when I have the chance. Now, right below those submission types, you can see that I just set mine as text entry. We're just going to use that for right now. But below that, I have some additional uh, controls that I can implement in my assignment. Right below the submission types, I can choose how many attempts students get. Right now, by default, it's set to unlimited. So they can submit something to me, submit it again, submit it again, submit it again, so on and so forth. They're not going to reach any barriers there. I can change that, though, to limited, and I can say how many attempts students get. So maybe they get three attempts. That may or may not be helpful to you, depending on your context. We will talk more about group assignments and peer reviews in a later session, so I'm going to skip over that today. But then down at the bottom, you can see that I now have the ability to assign my assignment to students, and I get the option to set due dates and available from dates and until dates. And so just a quick walkthrough of these is due date is exactly what it sounds like. I want the assignment turned in at this point. Available from date, though, says that students can't open and look at this assignment until what time? And so I might say something like, if I don't want my students to access this until Monday, I'm going to set this date for Monday at the time class starts. Similarly, the until date is when the assignment will lock. So I'm going to keep the assignment open for three weeks, but after that, I don't want to accept any more submissions. And then you can put in the appropriate date and time right there as needed. Um, can you require more than one on an assignment? In other words, multiple files related to a project or would that need to be broken out into multiple assignments? Really good question, Danielle. Um, this will, so you mostly asked about file uploads. Uh, so I'll speak to that first, but then I'll also speak to another thing that you might be touching on here. So with your file uploads, Students um, should be able to submit multiple files at once. Some instances have limited that so that students can only submit one file at a time. Um, what I would recommend that you do in your instance is that you save your assignment and just go in and try to upload multiple files at once and see if it lets you. If it doesn't let you, then the workaround is that you're going to have to adjust your submission attempts to either be unlimited or a number high enough to allow people to submit again and again to it. Um, and I can show you what that looks like if you want further clarification there. The other thing that you might be touching on, though, is that as you can see right here, I have text entry uh, highlighted, but then I also have file uploads selected. And so I can allow students to either do a text entry or a file upload is what this indicates here, is they're going to have the choice which one they want to do. Importantly, though, this does not require them to submit both before turning in the assignment. So what I mean by that is if I check both of these, Canvas will essentially prompt them to use one of them, but will not prompt them to use both of them. So I would consider this just like additional options, not necessarily guidance that they need to submit multiple things. Um, did that clarify that information? Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that did. I am just working on an assignment where it's for teachers, where they'll be designing an experiment, um, and I have the option for them to upload additional supporting documentation and didn't know if that just needed to be somewhere other than where they're submitting the assignment. Really good question. Um, you could do it both ways. Both ways work. So they should be able to submit that supporting documentation within that given assignment. Uh, but I've also seen a lot of teachers break it out into its own assignment. So either way should be okay. Cool. Um, moving back to this assign box, the last thing that I wanted to point out here is just that where it says assign to, by default, you're going to get this little tag that says everyone. And so that means that everyone in this course is going to get this assignment. However, you do have the ability to adjust to that. So you can see that if I take that out, I can now start typing in a name 
And Val is one of my colleagues. Uh, I work with Val, but you can see that she's a quote unquote student in my class. And so I could potentially just assign an assignment only to Val. And if I do that, none of the other students inside of my course will be able to see this assignment. It simply won't exist for them. Val will be the only one who can see it. Um, so it's not like it exists, but they're locked out. They simply, it just doesn't exist. Um, the important element here though, is that beyond to assigning to individual students, I could actually even type in more students. So you can see I'm right here too. So I could assign it to two students if I wanted to. Uh, but additionally, if you have different sections for a course, you can assign it to individual sections. What I typically see teachers do with this though, is they might say something like, you know what, I talked to Val, she has some extenuating circumstance in her life. And so I'm going to set the due date for Val as let's say September 27th. However, I can also then click plus assign to here, and then I can choose everyone else. And everyone else, the assignment is going to be due on September 13th. And so you can differentiate things that way if you want to as well. Uh, and this becomes really helpful, mostly in my experience, with the until dates. Uh, and what I mean by that is, for instance, in my classroom, I might say, OK, everyone has five weeks to turn in this assignment. But after this date, it's too late. You can't turn it in anymore. However, I know that I have a student who's in the hospital right now. And I'm obviously going to want to give them more time because they physically cannot complete the assignment right now. I would go in and I would change that one student's until date until much further out. And that would leave it open for them. So you do have a lot of flexibility in these assigned two boxes right here. Finally, Canvas has recently added a standard alignment box. So you can go in here and align a standard. Uh, that involves using Canvas's mastery tracker, which we're not necessarily going to talk about. But if you're interested in that, please feel free to just send me a follow-up email. Now, once all of those things have been established, you could then either save your assignment, which means that it's saved, you haven't lost your progress, but students cannot see it yet, or you can save and publish, which makes it accessible to students. I'm going to hit save and publish here. That way, what I can do is I can go into student view and show you what it will look like for them. Now, once I open this up, you can see that they're going to see the title of the assignment. They're going to they're going to see the assignment details right here, and they're going to see whatever you put in the rich content editor. Now, you may remember I just wrote out this outline for instructions, so that's all that there that's there. But anything that you put there would appear right here. Once they're ready, they need to click on Start Assignment, and then you can see that this box appears right below your instructions where they have their file upload option, which you can see here. And in my Canvas instance, you, you can see that they have the option to add another file. I'm assuming that exists in yours, but some instances have that turned off. Um, right next to that, they have a text entry box. So like I mentioned before, this is a box where they can just type whatever they need to type. Um, and by default, students are going to get Google Drive, Google Drive LTI 1.3, Lucid Chart and Office 365. The only thing that I'll comment on here with these apps is if they use one of these, it will allow them to select a file directly from their Google Drive or their Office account. That way they don't have to download it and upload it. They can just select it right from Google Drive. I would recommend though that they use Google Drive LTI 1.3 because that's the newest version. So if you're talking to students, I would just direct them away from the Google Drive version and over to the LTI 1.3 version. Um, that is a really quick overview of how to build an assignment in Canvas. Uh, what questions can I respond to here before we begin talking about rubrics and discussions and quizzes? All right, perfect. Well, we'll keep moving right along then. So where I am right now is I just saved and published my assignment. But even if you only saved your assignment and haven't published it, you should still see a similar screen. And if you've lost this screen, the way you're going to get there is by clicking on assignments and then selecting whatever assignment you're working with here. Um, 
Jamie, I see your question. I am revamping my business office specialist class to use Google Docs while I'm specifying the file upload that will actually upload using, yes, yeah. So um, Canvas is going to require you to select one of those boxes, text entry, file upload, so on and so forth. But regardless of what you select, they're always going to have that Google Drive option. So I typically just recommend that people select the file upload one. That's usually the easiest. Um, now, once you have this screen open and maybe you've saved your assignment, you'll see down at the bottom, you have the ability to add a rubric. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. Uh, and you can see that this box opens up here. And Canvas is going to prompt me to title my rubric. So I'm going to say demo rubric one. Uh, and then if I wanted to, I could even find a rubric that I've already used in my course. So if I know that I have a rubric that I created for an assignment last week, and it also applies to this assignment, I can just find that if I want to. But for the time being, I'm going to build one with you now. What I can do here is first off on my left-hand side, I define my criteria. So I can click on my little pencil icon and I can label this. So I might say something like depth. I want my students to write for two pages, whatever the case may be. And I can put in a longer description if I want, but for the time being, I'm just going to click on update criteria. Then to the side, you can see that I'm going to have a couple of rubric options that I'm going to use to score my students. By default, these are set to five points and zero points, full marks and no marks. But again, as you can see, I can edit those and say the top qualification is going to be maybe worth, let's say one point. And I can even change how it's titled. And so I can say something like full credit or I can leave it at full marks. And then I can write in my description of what students need to do to earn full credit. Uh, so we'll just say write two pages. Hopefully your rubrics are a little bit more detailed than that, but this will work for now. Uh, additionally, I have this little plus button so I can add columns if I want to, and I'm gonna do that here. So I'm gonna say 0 0.5 and I'll call this one half credit. And I won't worry about writing a description right now, but then I can go into this one, leave it at zero points and say no credit. And then as you can see, Canvas is going to automatically adjust how many points this rubric line is worth. I can then go ahead and add another criterion. Uh, and so I can click on new criterion, add that in. Um, I might say something like grammar. This is going to be how well they did with their punctuation and whatnot. Uh, and I can repeat the same process that I had before. Regardless though, you'll see that as I add in lines, they're gonna default to five points and then Canvas will update how many points this assignment is worth. Now, you may remember that before I said that this assignment should be worth four points. If I were to save this rubric right now or hit create rubric, Canvas would pop up with a little error that says, the point value of your rubric differs from the point value that you entered into the assignment. Which one do you want to use? Uh, and it will kind of adjust accordingly. In order to avoid that error, error though, I would probably go in and just make sure that they're adding up to four as I create this rubric. Now, you can also see that they have an option here to select a range, which means that in here, I can actually type in how many points students are getting between one and zero rather than just selecting a box. Typically as a grader, it's easier for me to just select the box. So I don't toggle that on most of the time, but that does exist. Down at the bottom, you'll see that you have some controls for your rubric itself. You can choose to write your own comments into the rubric. Uh, so rather than using those qualifications that you maybe entered in as your ratings, you can check this to turn those off. And now you just write your own description for each line of the rubric. Uh, you could choose to remove the point values from your rubric if you want to. You can also um, post or not post the outcomes to Mastery Gradebook, which we won't talk about today. Um, but what's typically most useful for people is this text box right here that says, use this rubric for assignment grading. In other words, I am going to click in the right places in the rubric, and then I want Canvas to automatically put that score in the gradebook. I do not want to have to click through the rubric and then add the score myself. 
That's what this text box means. And typically I recommend that most people turn that on because if you're using a rubric, why not have Canvas just send the score to the gradebook for you? Once you have adjusted everything that you need to adjust, you'll just hit create rubric here. I'm gonna hit that and it's going to give me this error because you can see that my rubric is only worth two points and my assignment is worth four. But I'll go ahead and show you what that looks like. Uh, and so you can see leaving the assignments total points at four and the rubrics total points at two will result in a maximum possible score of 50% for student submissions with this rubric. So it's telling you if you move forward right now, no student is ever going to possibly get 100%. I'm going to click on change uh, and that will automatically change my point value to whatever the rubric says right there, as you can see. Now, adding in that rubric obviously adds specificity for your students, but it will also speed up the grading process for you as well. And we will talk about that, but I'm going to save that for just a moment so that we can touch on discussions and quizzes. Now, um, at this point, I'm just going to keep pressing along to make sure that we can get through the next couple of elements. But if you do have questions, again, feel free to just toss them into the chat. Now, right below my assignments tab, I also have a discussions tab. And just as a reminder, I can create discussions through my discussions tab, or I can still create them through my modules tab like I showed you before, where you go to a module and click on the plus button, choose discussion, and then click create topic. Today though, I'm going to go to the discussions page and I'm going to click plus discussion right up here to create a new discussion. You can see that I also can adjust settings for all of the discussions in my course if I wanted to. I have some more controls there, uh, but for today we'll just build a discussion and you can explore settings later if you'd like to. Now, once I click on plus discussion, you'll see that again, I have my rich content editor. So I'm going to just say demo discussion. I can add whatever instructions or media I need to. And then below that, excuse me, I have some discussion controls that are going to be fairly similar to the assignment controls that we just looked at. So do we want this to be an anonymous discussion? You have off, which means that no, it's not anonymous at all. Everyone can see each other's names. Partial, which means that students can opt in to being anonymous or showing their name or you can make it fully anonymous if you want, uh, where their names and profile pictures are hidden. And just to be clear here, fully anonymous is fully anonymous for other students. It is not anonymous for you as the teacher. So just keep that in mind as you're determining which one you want. Um, you can choose to disallow threaded replies. That just means do you want students to be able to reply and comment on each other's posts? By default, they're able to, but if you wanna turn that off, you can. Uh, you can also say that students have to post their own comment before they can see other people's comments, if you toggle this on. Uh, you can enable a podcast feed where students are able to basically subscribe to your discussion. You can allow students to like posts if they want to, uh, and you can manually add it to the student's to-do list. Um, all of these come into play as you're building a discussion. Then again, you can see that you have your assignment options right here, um, and then you can set those to whatever they need to be as well. Now, I have this little error that's popping up that says grading and groups are not supported in anonymous discussions. Um, if it becomes fully anonymous, Canvas disables the ability for it to be a graded discussion. And so I'm going to turn that off so that I can now see that this box appears that says, yes, this assignment is going to be graded. And then once I toggle that on, you can see that I get some of the other controls that I had in my assignments as well, where I can say it's worth four or 10 or 20 points. I wanna display those as points and it goes in X, Y, and Z assignment group. And I have those controls again. Um, now that was a really quick overview of your Canvas discussions. I'm not going to necessarily save this discussion, but again, discussions work in much the same way as assignments do. The only difference is that now students are posting responses to a discussion board where they can see each other's responses, comment on each other's responses, read each other's responses. Are there any big questions about discussions that I can answer before we touch on quizzes and grading?
All right, perfect. Now we have about 15 minutes left today. Uh, and like I mentioned before, I do wanna to touch on quizzes and grading before we wrap everything up. Uh, that being said, I know that I'm not going to be able to give justice to quizzes uh, in just the time that we have today. So I wanna let you know that today I'm going to give you the kind of the short version and the primer. And then next week, we'll get into a little bit more depth with quizzes before talking in about the rest of the elements that we're going to discuss next time. So today, uh, we're going to go to a really quick overview of quizzes. Again, more depth will come next week and we'll point out more of the features then. Now, just like with anything else that we've talked about today, I can create a new quiz through the modules or I can create it through quizzes. Today, I'm going to go to my quizzes tab. So I'm going to select that. And then you can see I have a list of my quizzes here and I'm going to click on plus quiz. Now, in most cases, this little box is going to pop up when you go to create a quiz. Canvas is in the process of redesigning what their quizzes look like. So there's two quote unquote quiz engines that you can choose from. The first is classic quizzes, which is the older software. So you can use the way that it's been set up for years and years. Uh, if you're used to that way, you can keep using that way. The way that I would recommend most people go though is new quizzes. First off, because it's newer and so the interface is a little bit better, you have more options inside of it. But importantly, the reason I really recommend it for most people is because Canvas will eventually force everyone to migrate to new quizzes. Uh, right now, it sounds like that migration will probably come in a year to two years. But I hate for people to continue building things in the older thing that they're going to have to move over and transfer into the newer thing. So I, I typically recommend that people select new quizzes here, which is what I will do today. Uh, you do have the ability to let Canvas just set that as your default so that it doesn't ask you again. I like leaving this up though so that I can talk through that with people as I train. I'll hit submit though. Um, and then once I hit submit again, I have the same tools that should start to look really familiar to you. I can set how many points it's worth, what assignment group it is, in what the due date is, so on and so forth. Down at the bottom though, you'll notice that I have a new option along here. So I can hit save, save and publish, but I can also hit build. And once I hit build, oops, I need to put a name in there, uh, sample quiz. Once I hit build though, it will take me to a new page where I can begin constructing my quiz. Uh, and so now in my quiz, I can adjust the title. I can click on this little pencil to add instructions if I want here. Um, I could save those. But importantly, I have this plus button right here where I can now begin adding questions to my quiz. Now, before we get into questions and everything like that, I do wanna point out that along the top here, I do have settings for my quiz. I do have reports for my quiz. I have moderation options for my quiz. These are all of the elements that we'll discuss in more detail next time. So if you're looking at those and curious about what those mean and how to use those, we'll chat about those, just not quite today. Now, that being said, as far as the construction of the quiz itself, I can click on that little plus button and then I get all these options of the different types of quiz items that I can include. So I can ask students to categorize things, upload files, so on and so forth. You can read through all of these if you'd like to. Uh, we will talk more about different question types next week, but today I'm just going to choose multiple choice because it's fairly straightforward. When I click on multiple choice, I can name my question if I'd like to. Uh, this is helpful if you are writing a lot of quiz questions and you want to use maybe this specific quiz question in a later quiz that you're designing, you can do that in Canvas. And so if you want to do that, I would recommend naming your questions. But if you're just creating a simple quiz, you don't anticipate ever using these questions somewhere else, you don't necessarily need to, you're not required to name them. Right below that, you can enter in your question itself and you'll see that the rich content editor appears again. So you can add media, you can type text, whatever you need to do here. I'm just going to hit sample. And then I can type in all of my different answers. Uh, so I'm gonna say just A, B, C, and D just for the time being. Uh, and then 
I can select which one is correct. Importantly, I do want to highlight that for each of those answers, again, I still get the rich content editor. So students could be choosing pictures. They could be choosing um, formulas. They can choose a lot of different things here. I can even embed things into my answer options if I'd like to. So just keep that in mind. You do have a lot of flexibility with the media that you incorporate into your quiz questions. Um, along the side here, I can even add feedback for all of my question answers if I want to. And so I could say something like, good job, uh, if they select the right answer, and that will pop up after they have submitted the quiz. Or if they select the wrong answer, I can explain why it's wrong, and I can tell them why they missed it and things like that. And again, they don't see this until after they've submitted their quiz. Uh, once I'm ready, I can hit done there and it will save that feedback. And then you can see that I have some more options down below where I can add more answer options. I can give students an on-screen calculator. Um, I can shuffle the choices of these answers so that they're different for every student and they move around. Uh, and one thing that I think is really cool is I can also vary the points by the answer too and say, okay, if you answered this way, that means that you're gonna get five points on the quiz. If you answered this one, it's not right, but it's kind of close. So maybe you get two points for that one. And these ones are just flat out wrong. So you get zero points for that. And you do have the capability to enter that if you want to. Um, I'm going to turn that off though. Oops, I'm gonna keep editing that, sorry. I'm gonna turn that off though, just so that I can highlight down here. I have the ability to set how many points this question is worth. If I set very points by answer, can, Canvas is just going to use whatever I type in here. But if that's off, I can say this question is worth five points or whatever the case may be. And if I really wanted to, I could add feedback to the entire question. So no matter how people respond, they're going to get this feedback that pops up once they submit their quiz. Once I've written those questions, I can hit done. It saves that question and I can continue adding to my quiz as needed. Now, again, that was a really quick overview on how you might start building quizzes. You are more than welcome to explore that as much as you need to. But like I said before, we're going to dedicate some time during our next session to talking about quizzes in a little bit more depth. Today, though, I'm going to go ahead and return back to my course. And the last thing that I want to touch on before we leave today is simply grading and some of the options that exist for you to make grading a little bit easier so that you can give feedback to students. So what I want to do is I'm going to go back to that assignment that I created before. Uh, again, you can see that it's this adult ed demo assignment right here, and it's published. Now, the reason I'm highlighting this assignment is because I am going to complete this assignment as a student, and then I'm going to grade it as if I were the instructor. So I'm going to go back to my modules, and I'm going to add it into one of these modules so that I, as the student, can access it. I'm just going to put that at the bottom of this module here, and then I'm going to go into student view, and now I'm acting as a student. Oops, I need to go back. I apologize. Uh, you may remember that from last session, I locked the modules so that students have to complete all of the items in order before they can move on. Uh, I'm going to uncheck that, though, so that I don't have to step through all of these assignments today. Now, you can see that I can access that assignment, and I'm going to click into it. And as the student, I can see the instructions. I can see the rubric. I'm going to hit Start Assignment. I don't have a file to upload today, but I do have some things to say. And so I'm going to write my response. Um, once I'm happy with my response, I can then click on Submit Assignment. And that will go through, and I'll get this confetti showing that I've done my assignment, which is great. Uh, but importantly, as the teacher, so now switching back to the teacher view, if I have that assignment open, you can see that on the side, I have zero out of one assignments graded, and I have the power to download all of my submissions or open SpeedGrader, which, which is where I'll actually grade those. Additionally, though, I want to highlight that on the home page of this course, you can now see that I have something under my to-do list, which is to grade that assignment submission. And that will pop up right here as a prompt that you have some grading to do. Now, once I click on that, I have the ability to grade it. Uh, so I am going to see my student's response right here. I can adjust how those responses are given to me with these settings right here. 
Uh, so if I click on options, you can see that I can sort my student knit list by all of these different types. So maybe I want to see uh, assignments based on the date they were submitted to me. Maybe I want them randomized. Maybe I just want them by student last name. I can even hide students' names too so that I'm grading students' work anonymously, which is pretty cool as well. Importantly though, over here on the right-hand side, I have all of my different grading options. Uh, so Canvas will tell me the word count. It will tell me when it was submitted. Uh, and then I can type in a grade right in this little box if I want to. Or what I can do is I can click on view rubric and I can click on the rubric categories that apply and hit save. And Canvas will automatically enter that score for me. Right below that, I have the ability to write comments if I'd like. Um, but additionally, you'll see that I have some options here as well that I want to highlight just briefly before we go today. I can attach a file to my comment with this little paper clip, clip icon. Uh, I can talk out my comment by clicking on speech recognition, or I can speak to Canvas. Uh, and Canvas will transcribe my comment if I want to do it that way. Or what can be really powerful is I click on this video. And now I have the ability to record media inside of SpeedGrader and use that as my comment. So again, here's another video of me. I'm going to toggle that off though. And you can see that I can still record audio if I want to and just leave an audio comment that says, hey, you did really good on X, Y, and Z, but you need to improve this. Or I can even record my screen and I can then go through, and this is going to be weird. This is going to be like screen recording inception. So hopefully it isn't too crazy. Uh, it's going to be a little bit funky because I'm already highlighting and sharing my screen. But truly what I could do is then I could go to their response and highlight different portions of that and talk through it with them in my comment, which can be really powerful. And again, I can just hit start recording whenever I'm ready, stop recording whenever I'm done. Um, I'll go ahead and exit out of that though. And then once you are ready to comment, you'll just hit the submit button here and your comment will go to that student and they'll be able to see it in their feedback. Additionally, though, the last tool that I want to highlight before we wrap up, and I know that we're pretty much to the end, but the last tool that I want to highlight is you can see that I have this little comment button with the number three right next to it. And what this is, is my comment library. And if I click on my comment library, it pulls up comments that I have saved that I use over and over and over again that I know that I'm going to want to use again in the future. And so if I have something that I know that I'm telling students all the time, uh, so maybe I want a comment that says, write more. <laughs> you might want to rephrase it so it's not quite as brusque as that. Uh, but you can put whatever comments you need and write it out in great detail once. Maybe you include links there, so on and so forth. And then once you've done that, you can click add to my library and that will be added in. Now, the way that becomes really useful for you is as you are grading, you can either click on your library and scroll through those comments and select the one that you want. So maybe I want this one. Or additionally, I can also go into that library and toggle this on so that Canvas will automatically show suggestions while I'm typing based on the words that I'm typing in. So you can see that the first word in this comment is thanks. If I start typing in thanks in this comment box, you'll see that my comment library appears right here with two comments that include the word thanks. And I can just click on that one and it will fill it into the comment for me and then I can hit submit. And that will really help make your feedback a lot faster if you're grading a lot of work. One of the things that I like to do, uh, and I promise this example will be quick, but one of the things that I liked to do when I was grading a lot of assignments all the time is I would create comments in my comment library that said something like, hey, I noticed that you had a handful of comma mistakes in your writing today. Here are a couple of resources that will help you learn more about commas. And then I'd include a link to a YouTube video, a link to a Nearpod lesson, things like that, maybe a link to a website. And those would all be saved in my comment library. So that now I don't need to go through and add all those links every time. And additionally, I'm giving really in-depth feedback to students every single time because they can link out to all these different resources, which will help them implement my feedback as well. So I highly recommend utilizing that comment library because it can become really powerful. 
The last thing that I'll say about it, and then I promise we'll wrap up, is that your comment library applies to your entire Canvas account. So what I mean by that is these comments don't necessarily stick within a course. So if I'm teaching a biology course and a language arts course, if I add something to my comment library, it will now appear in the comment library for both of those courses. Some people like that, some people don't like that. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but I did want to just clarify that as those comments do travel between courses. So all of that said, I know that I had to move quickly through that last element, and I promise we will talk more about quizzes next time. But I do want to just say that if you have any questions, if you want more details, if there's something that you're confused about, please feel free to stay on the call today. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you have a really good one. Uh, and then I will see you again next week. Like I said, though, feel free to stay on the call if you have any lingering questions that you want to talk about.